<clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you all here. I wonder how, I'm, how many other aliases there are in this <laughs> class. <laughs> Well, we've come in our uh, study of Revelation to the end of our section of the book that deals with the tribulation today. We're in chapters 16, 17, and 18. If you want to turn in your Bibles to chapter 16, we'll begin there. <clears throat> this is the uh, end of this seven-year period of the outpouring of God's wrath on humankind for people's rejection of him, not only uh, because they have rejected his son, uh, if they've heard of him, but if they haven't heard of him, their judgment is coming on them because they have failed to respond to the revelation that God has given in nature, as Paul explains in Romans chapter 1, <clears throat> everybody should respond to God because there is adequate evidence of him uh, all around us. Psalm 19 uh, also discusses natural revelation. So uh, this is going to be a time of intense trouble for people who are living on the earth. And uh, in the sequence of events here, We've pointed out that in this section of the book, uh, there's a progression chronologically between the outpouring of various judgments, first the seals, then the trumpets, and now the bowls. But interspersed with that, within that is supplementary revelation that helps us understand what conditions will be like uh, during the tribulation in various areas of life. And we'll look at uh, one of those today as well. We've come to the section of bowl judgments, which uh, I believe grow out of the seventh trumpet judgment. The seventh trumpet judgment being the bowl's judgment, like the seventh seal trumpet being all of the trumpets and all of the bowl judgments. They were not described specifically, but a whole new series of judgments was introduced when we read about the seventh seal and the seventh trumpet. Uh, there are really seven bowls, so this diagram is a little inaccurate that way, but uh, that's the relationship that they have to one another. So we read, Then I heard a loud voice from, from the temple, saying to the seven angels, this is uh, John looking into heaven again, it's the heavenly temple, he's seeing angels. This voice tells these seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. <clears throat> this, this chapter is characterized by uh, a word that is translated several different ways, but it's always the same Greek word, and I'll, I'll point it out as we go along, but it means intense or loud. And here it's translated loud. It's a loud voice. And this word helps us to appreciate the intensity of the judgments at this time. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth. It's as though it had liquid in it, you see, and he pours it out. And a harmful and painful sore afflicted the people who had the mark of the beast and who worshipped the beast. Now we're reminded when we read this verse of the plague in Egypt back in Exodus where God sent boils on people. Remember that was one of the ten plagues and that was a literal plague. And uh, 
so we're encouraged to view these plagues as literal because the same terminology is used, you see. It's not obviously the same plague separated by thousands of years, but uh, the same thing is being said about the future as was said about the past. The second angel poured out his bowl into the seas, and it became blood like that of a dead man, and every living thing in the sea died. The first judgment in Egypt was turning water into blood. Whether this is actual blood or whether it will look like blood is debated, but uh, it's possible, I suppose, that it could be literal blood. The chemical composition of seawater and blood is very similar, only one element of difference. So perhaps uh, the mountain that falls into the sea earlier, remember, turned some of the water into blood there. Then the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. These are the fresh water sources. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, Righteous are you, the one who is and who was, O Holy One, because you judged these things. For they, that is, those who worship the beast and his image, poured out the blood of saints and prophets, and you were given them blood to drink. You have given them blood to drink. They deserve it. And I heard the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. The altar seems to be here used as a personification of those around the altar or under the altar in heaven that we've read about before. These are tribulation saints who have gone into the Lord's presence because they have died during this seven year period. <clears throat> so God is going to give back to the persecutors of his people the same type of punishment as they dished out to the believers. Just like Pharaoh put the Hebrew babies to death, so God put Pharaoh's baby to death, his son. Just like Haman built a gallows to hang Mordecai, God arranged things so that Haman himself was hung on, on the gallows that he built. And this is typically the way God judges. He uh, pays back in kind. Um, it's very interesting how often that occurs in scripture. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun and it was given power to scorch people with fire and the people were scorched with fierce heat. Now here's that word again. Megalis is the Greek word intense heat, and they blaspheme the name of God who has the power over these plagues, and they did not repent so as to give him glory. So again, we read that these people who are under the judgment of God harden their hearts, just like Pharaoh did. And uh, rather than repenting, turning back to God, they continue to oppose him. And the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became darkened, and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. Again, darkness was a plague in Egypt, you remember? And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. How this is going to happen remains to be seen. I, I don't know how God is going to work this darkening or this bloodletting over all the earth, but uh, I believe it's going to happen because um, of what is said here. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way 
would be prepared for the kings from the east. Uh, God previously dried up the Red Sea so the Israelites could leave Egypt. He previously dried up the Jordan River so the Israelites could enter the Promised Land. He's going to dry up the Euphrates River so that armies from the east can converge on Palestine. And other passages tell us that there's going to be a great convergence of enemies of God from the west, east, north, and south on the land of Palestine at this time. And uh, that's what these armies from the east refer to. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, that was Satan, you'll remember, and out of the mouth of the beast, Antichrist, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. Um, in John's day, frogs were a symbol of demons. So this would have been very clear to John's original readers that he was talking about demons, for they are spirits of demons. This chapter is unique also in that it interprets so many of the things that it says. And this is one instance of that. They are the spirits of demons. There are about 24 um, instances in the book of Revelation where the text itself interprets a symbol. And this is one of those places. Performing signs which go out to the kings of the entire world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God, the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Jesus promised that in the, in the Olivet Discourse, you remember, in Matthew 24, that uh, he would be coming like a thief. That, how does a thief come? Well, he comes unexpectedly by those who are living at the time, and that will be mainly unbelievers. Believers, of course, will have the Bible and they will understand what's going on, but the vast majority of people will not know that Jesus' coming is just around the corner. It's imminent. In uh, Paul's epistles, Paul writes that the rapture of the church, his calling of us as Christians to himself, will also be like a thief. That is, people living on the earth will be surprised by it, and they, they will not know in advance that it's coming. Behold, I'm coming like a thief. A burglar stalked a neighborhood watching for homes that uh, he could rob when people went on vacation. He watched as the family loaded their suitcases into their car and departed. And uh, he waited until dark and then he approached the front door and rang the doorbell. Nobody answered, so he proceeded to pick the lock and, and got into the house. And he called out, is anyone there? And he heard a voice saying, I see you and Jesus sees you. He was shocked. And so he said, who's there? And the voice repeated, I see you and Jesus sees you. Well, he was dumbfounded. And so he switched on the light. And to his surprise, there was a parrot in a cage and the parrot said, I see you, and Jesus sees you. But he also saw a huge Doberman pincher sitting under the cage. And the parrot then said, attack, Jesus, attack. <laughs> well, Jesus is going to attack <laughs> at this time. Now this is looking forward to, to his coming, which we'll read about in chapter 19. Here his coming is announced. 
Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and people will not see his shame. This is another blessing, the third one in the book that we've read. And this one is for those who are on the earth at this time and are alert to what's going on and, and know that the Lord's coming is very near and they keep their clothes. Clothes in scripture often are a symbol for what people see when they look at us. In other words, it's our testimony to other people. They are careful about how they behave, um, how they live among others. That's their clothing, you see. Uh, Jewish tradition tells us that uh, in Old Testament times, <clears throat> the priests would guard the temple day and night. There were actually hundreds of priests who surrounded the temple and guarded it because it was the Fort Knox of Israel. It housed the treasures of the king and the nation but also because it was holy space. And as these uh, supervisors of these priests made their rounds at night, if they found a guard who was asleep, they would set his clothes on fire. And uh, that would be, of course, not only embarrassing, but very painful. And uh, this may be an illusion to that. They are not falling asleep at the switch. They're ready for the Lord to come. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Har Megiddon, which means the mountain of Megiddo. And uh, that may refer to the little mound on which the town of Megiddo in northern Israel is built. It may refer to Mount Gilboa, which is the closest sizable mountain on the southern edge of the Jezreel Valley, where the Battle of Armageddon will take place. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. Remember when Jesus died, he says, it is finished. If people do not accept it is finished, they will have to accept it is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake, such as there had not been, that's, that, there's that word again, a megalase earthquake, huge, such as there had not been since mankind came upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it, and so mighty. We read earlier about an earthquake that was coming, but that was earlier in the tribulation. This is another one, even greater. And the great city, the Megalese city, Jerusalem, was split into three parts, and the city of the nations fell. Um, geologists have identified a fault uh, on the Mount of Olives right next to Jerusalem and uh, it could, you know, they talk a kid about California falling into the sea because of the San Andreas Fault. There's a fault like that right at Jerusalem. So maybe that's what God will use that will be part of this earthquake. Babylon the Great was remembered in the sight of God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled and no mountains were found. Um, there's going to be a worldwide catastrophe similar to the flood, but uh, Zechariah tells us more information about how the topographical changes on planet Earth will take place 
at this time. And huge hailstones weighing about a talent each. A talent is a hundred pounds. Imagine <laughs> a hailstone the size of a sack of cement falling out of the sky, came down from heaven upon people, and people blasphemed God because of the plagues of the hail. Hail was another plague during the Exodus because the hailstone plague was megalice, severe, extremely severe. So these are the seven bold judgments that probably will come quite quickly, one right after the other, toward the end of this seven year period of the tribulation. Now, as we look at these in comparison with the seals and trumpets, it's uh, quite clear that these are different judgments. There have been some students of the book who have uh, believed that they are a repetition and uh, that all three sets really describe more or less symbolically and uh, not literally what will happen. But if we take a closer look, they're quite different from one another, which supports the, the view that they are in sequence. So what? What should we learn from chapter 16? Well, we can learn that if people do not repent, worse judgment will come upon them. Uh, these people hardened their heart. They blasphemed God because of the plagues. And uh, so they just experienced more judgment. These are unbelievers. But the same principle holds true for all people. When writing to the Corinthians, Paul wrote them to deal with the sin in their assembly or God would step in and judge. And that's a principle. God gives us time to deal with our sin, to confess it, to forsake it, to repent of it. He's patient with us in order to lead us to repentance. But if we do not repent, then judgment will come. Many people today say, well, God isn't doing anything about the situation in the world. Maybe he's not there, maybe he doesn't care. Peter says, no, God is waiting for people to repent before he sends these judgments. So for us as believers, we need to remember that we need to keep short accounts with the sin in our lives. We need to deal with it on a daily basis because if we don't, if we postpone it, if we harden our hearts, then God will step in and he will act. He won't bring us into the tribulation, but he will discipline us as his people. Second, we need to stay awake in view of the imminent coming of Christ. Now this promise of the Lord coming like a thief has to do with his second coming. But Paul gave promises of his imminent return in his epistles that are identical with this. And uh, so we need to be aware that the Lord's coming could be at any moment. We have a little plaque that I made in VBS when I was a child sitting on our kitchen um, shelf it says perhaps today and it's a constant reminder for us that the lord's return could happen today and uh, we need to be aware of his coming because that will affect how we live and in particular we also need to keep our clothes clean in view of his imminent coming we need to be careful about how we live about our testimony with unbelievers about uh, what unbelievers are concluding about us as God's people because this could be the last day we live on planet Earth. He could call us home at any time.
We move now from chapter 16 in the seven bowl judgments to the last section of supplementary revelation in the tribulation period. And this is in chapter 17 and 18. And it deals with the judgment of ungodly systems in the great tribulation. And this is really eye opening. Come on, back up on me here. All right. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters or beside many waters. So John sees this prostitute. And the angel says, with whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality. Uh, this too is symbolic. Old Testament revelation frequently describes idolatry as spiritual immorality. It's departure from the worship of God to the worship of other things. Idolatry. God calls that spiritual immorality, immorality, sexual immorality. It is as bad to him as that is to us, or should be to us. And those who live on the earth became drunk with the wine of her sexual immorality. So this is a uh, something that lures people into idolatry. This pro a prostitute is a, one, is a woman, of course, who lures another person into sin. And he earned, he carried me away in the spirit in a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So this prostitute is a woman, and she's sitting on a scarlet beast. Now, the beast is described as full of blasphemous names, having seven horns and ten horns, uh, uh, seven heads and ten horns. So this identifies the beast as Antichrist. So here is this woman sitting on top of a beast and a controlling influence over the beast. It's like she's riding it. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold, precious stones and pearls, holding in her cup, in her hand, a gold cup full of abominations and of the unclean things of her sexual immorality. So she's very attractive. And on her forehead, a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes. She's not only one of them, she's the mother of all prostitutes. She is the source of all temptations to depart from God and to go into idolatry. She's the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. All kinds of sin spring from this woman. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. So she's antagonistic to believers. She's killed them. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. And the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. So he's going to interpret this for us in the verses to follow. So this is a mystery, something not previously revealed, but now made clear. I want to tell you about another mystery. A man was raised in the back hills of West Virginia. He was so far out in the sticks that he never in his life had seen a big city to say nothing of modern inventions and neon lights. 
He married a girl just like himself, and they spent all their married years in the backwoods. They had one son, whom they named Junior. Around the time Junior reached his 16th birthday, his dad began to realize that he wouldn't be too many years before his son would become a man and would strike out on his own. It troubled him that his boy could reach manhood and wind up getting a job in the city and not be prepared to face the real world. He felt responsible and decided to do something about it. So he and his wife started saving for a trip that three of them would take to the city. And about three years later, the big day arrived. They tossed their belongings in their old pickup truck and started the long journey over winding, rough roads to the city. Their plan was to spend several days at a swanky hotel and take in all the sights. As they approached the outskirts of the metropolis, Papa began to get a little jumpy. Mama, when we, get, when we pull up to the hotel, you stay in the truck while Junior and I go in and look around. We'll come back and get you, okay? She agreed. Flashing neon lights and uniformed doormen greeted them as they pulled up to their hotel. Mama stayed put as Papa and Junior walked wide-eyed into the lobby. Neither could believe his eyes. Before they even touched them, the doors opened automatically. Inside, they stood like statues, staring at the first chandelier either of them had ever seen. It hung from a ceiling three stories high. Off to the left was an enormous waterfall, rippling over inlaid stones and rocks. Junior, look! Papa was pointing toward a long mall where busy shoppers were going in and out of beautiful stores. Papa, look at there. Down below was an ice skating rink inside. While both stood silent, watching one breathtaking sight after another, they kept hearing a dinging sound behind them. Finally, Papa turned around and saw this amazing little room with doors that slid open in the center. What in the world, he thought. People would walk up, push a button, wait. Lights would flicker above the doors, and then, ding, the doors would slide open from the middle. Some people would walk out of the little room, and others would walk inside and turn around as, ding, the doors Slid shut. By now, dad and son stood totally transfixed. At that moment, a wrinkled old lady shuffled up to the doors all by herself. She pushed the button and waited for a few seconds. Ding! The doors opened. With a swish, she hobbled into the little room. Not more than 20 seconds later, the doors opened again, and there stood this fabulously attractive young woman in her 20s. High heels, shapely body, beautiful face, a real knockout. As she stepped out, smiled, and turned to walk away, Papa nudged his boy and mumbled, Hey, Junior, go get Mama. <laughs> Well, this mystery of Babylon is explained in verses 8 and following. The angel says, The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss. We read earlier that the beast's abode was in the abyss, the holding place for demons, some of the demons that are uh, in, the, in existence today, and go to destruction. He was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss. 
Remember we talked about the revival of the beast's life. He appears to die and then he comes back to life. And this is what leads many people to worship him. Replicating Jesus' resurrection, of course, is the Antichrist. And those who live on the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will wonder when they see the beast that he was and is not and will come. Those whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. If you are a believer, your name has been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Now that should be a comfort. Sometimes we wonder if God has forsaken us. He doesn't seem to be answering our prayers. The heavens are brass when we pray. Has he abandoned me? No, your name has been written in his book of life since before the creation. For remember that when you think that God has abandoned you. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sits. Now some have taken these as literal mountains. And since there are seven hills on which the city of Rome has been built, they have concluded that this is a reference to Rome. But mountains are used elsewhere in scripture as symbols of kingdoms and their heads, kings. And this verse, go, uh, verse 10 goes on, and they are seven kings. The mountains represent kingdoms, and he's now going to talk about the head of these kingdoms, the kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must remain a little while. The beast which was and is not is himself also an eighth and is one of the seven and he goes to destruction. He will eventually be destroyed. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom and they receive authority as kings from the beast for one hour, just a short period of time. These have one purpose and they give their power and authority to the beast. Now this is pretty hard to follow, so let me just illustrate it this way. Uh, he's talked about five kingdoms or, uh, yeah, kingdoms that have fallen. Uh, probably the major kingdoms in view are Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, Persia, and Greece from, Dan from uh, John's point of view. The kingdom that is would be Rome. The other that has not yet come evidently refers to the initial kingdom of the beast during which time he rules uh, over the earth uh, before his final judgment and then the eighth beast is the final aspect of the kingdom of the beast when he actually rules the whole world. The seventh may be his, his rule now over mankind in a spiritual sense. And the eighth may be his literal kingdom uh, when he's on the earth. He, he will have ten allies, evidently. Three of them will revolt and be subdued. We read elsewhere and it's alluded to here. So um, there will be seven heads finally. These will wage war against the Lamb, Jesus. And the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And those who are with him are the called and chosen and faithful. They are faithful to the Lord. 
When the Lord comes back, there will be many that come with him. We will be among that group, having gone to be in his presence at the rapture. And as Paul says, we will ever be with the Lord from then on. So when he comes back to the earth, we will come back with Jesus. We will have glorified bodies, immortal bodies. But there will be people living on the earth who have mortal bodies like we now have. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the, prostit where the prostitute sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. So this is the interpretation of the waters. We mentioned before that seas are all often uh, spoken of as uh, the mass of humanity. And uh, this is one of the evidences of that. And the ten horns which you saw and the beast, these will hate the prostitute, will make her desolate and naked, will eat her flesh and will burn her up with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to execute his purpose by giving a common purpose and by giving their kingdom to the beast until the words of God will be fulfilled. The woman whom you saw is the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, what city is that? Well, in John's day, of course, it was Rome. But this is talking about the future. And obviously, from what was said in verse 5, he's talking about Babylon, not Rome, not Jerusalem here. Babylon has ruled over the kings of the earth. In what sense? Well, Babylon is a, a real city, of course. It's in Iraq. But it is the site of the Tower of Babel that we read about in Genesis 11. I'm going to say more about that in a minute. In chapter 17, This prostitute that is sitting in a position of control over Antichrist is quite evidently a religious system. Throughout history, religion has determined how people believe and think. It determines the decisions that governmental leaders make. It is what motivates and propels people we see this clear, clearly in Islam, for instance. But it's true of all religion, or even of atheism, which is a religion. Chapter 17 talks about the religious system that controls Antichrist, and it's going to be destroyed by the beast. Now in chapter 18, that, that will happen, I believe, in the middle of the tribulation. Remember, this is a supplementary section. We're not chronologically progressing here. We're talking about the whole tribulation period. So that part, I believe, describes the destru uh, destruction at the middle of the tribulation when Antichrist casts off the woman when he rejects all religion and claims to be God. We read about that earlier. He will claim to be divine, and everyone in the world who is an unbeliever will worship him. Now we move to chapter 18, and we read of another aspect of Babylon. Babylon was the source of anti-God religion. It is the ultimate fountainhead of religion that turns away from God. I'll say more about that later. Chapter 18 tells us more about Babylon, the great. 
the mother of prostitutes, and about another aspect of its destruction by God, which will take place at the end of the tribulation. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated from his glory. And he cried out with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Now the city of Babylon actually fell to the Persians in 539 B.C. But this is an announcement of a future fall. She has become a dwelling place of demons and a prison of every unclean and a prison or a haunt of every unclean and hateful bird. In other words, it will be a desolate place. For all the nations have fallen because of the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, her influence for evil, and the kings of the earth have committed acts of sexual immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich from the excessive wealth of her luxury. Now, it's the excessive wealth of this system that is the focus of this judgment. I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. There will be believers on the earth at this time, so that you will not participate in her sins and receive any of her plagues. For her sins have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her offenses. Pay her back even as she has paid and give her back, give back to her double according to her deeds. Giving back double is a way of saying fully. Giving, give, give her fully what she deserves in the cup which she has mixed. Mix twice as much for her to the extent that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously to the same extent, give her torment and mourning. Now notice that. She's glorified herself, and second, she's lived luxuriously. We're going to find that those are key sins that God is going to work on here. I sit as a queen, and I am not a widow. I will never see mourning, she says. For this reason, in one day, her plagues will come. Plague and mourning and famine, she will be burned up with fire, for the Lord God who judges her is strong. Now let's go back to Genesis 11:4, the story of the Tower of Babel. This verse says, They, referring to Noah's descendants, said, Come, let's build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let's make a name for ourselves. Two things, they say here. A tower that will reach into heaven. The ancients believed that the closer you got to heaven, the closer you got to God. Even today, we think about God above us. So to build a tower to get to heaven is the equivalent of saving yourself by your works. Let's make a name for ourselves. This is self-glorification as opposed to glorifying God. So the very two things that the people at the Tower of Babel wanted to do continued throughout humanity to drive human existence. A desire to save oneself apart from God and a desire to glorify oneself. All through history, these things have continued. In Daniel 4.30, we read, The king, Nebuchadnezzar, began speaking and was saying, Is not this Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal re residence by the might of my power, and for the honor of my majesty. See, there's those two things again. 
I have done it by my power, and I have done it for my glory. Nebuchadnezzar was the great king of Babylon who built the city into the magnificent city that it was, 15 miles wide on every one of its four sides. Huge city. The hanging gardens were 400 feet high. They looked like a giant uh, Christmas tree. Uh, he had something to be proud of. But unfortunately, he did not give God the glory. And as we know from this chapter, God made an animal out of him temporarily so that he would learn to give God the glory. And uh, he did that. Verse 9, And the kings of the earth who committed acts of sexual immorality and lived luxuriously with her will weep and mourn over her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance because of the fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city Babylon, the strong city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Well, we know how that can happen. World center, world, uh, world, Trade Center came down in about an hour. Babylon's going to come down this way too. We're going to talk about what Babylon is in a minute. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple silks, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of ivory, every article made out of valuable wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, perfume, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, ship, cargoes of horses, carriages, slaves, and human lives. They'll be trading human lives at this time. And in, uh, in 2012, the State Department issued a, uh, a report indicating that human trafficking was the second largest world problem that there is in the world today behind drugs. And most of the money involved in human trafficking goes to arms purchases. Human trafficking will be very common in the tribulation. The, the fruit you long for has left you, and all things that were luxurious and splendid have passed away from you, and people will no longer find them. The merchants of these things who became rich from her will stand at a distance because of the fear of her torment, weeping and mourning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, she who was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and adorned with gold, pearls, stones, for in one hour... Such great wealth has been laid waste, and every shipmaster and every passenger and sailor and all who make their living by the sea stood at a distance and were crying out as they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like the great city? Why mention ship people, shipping people? Because in John's day, this was the means of distribution of goods. We know how important distribution is recently because... <laughs> The supply chain has been interrupted. And they threw dust on their heads and were crying out, weeping and warning, saying, Woe, woe, the great city in which all who had ships at sea became rich from their prosperity. For in one hour she has been laid waste. In one hour has been laid waste. Someone has written this yuppie prayer. You know, a yuppie is a young, upward, mobile, progressive professional. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray my Cusinart to keep. I pray my stocks are on the rise and that my analyst is wise, that all the wine I sip is white and that my hot tub's watertight, that racquetball won't get too tough, that my sushi's fresh enough. I pray my cordless phone will still works and my career won't lose its perks. My microwave won't radiate 
my condo won't, won't, won't depreciate. I pray my health club doesn't close and that my money market grows. If I go, to, if I go broke before I wake, I pray my Volvo they will take. <laughs> Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, because God has pronounced judgment for you against her. Then a strong angel picked up a stone like a great millstone, threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will never be found again. And the sound of harpists, musicians, flute players, trumpeters will never be heard in you again, and no craftsman of any craft will be found in you again. And the sound of a mill will never be heard in you again, and the light of a lamp will never shine in you again, and the voice of the groom and bride will never be heard in you again, for your merchants were the powerful people of the earth, because all the nations were deceived by your witchcraft, by thinking that meaning and purpose in life can be achieved by godlessness and the accumulation of wealth, selfishness, for selfish reasons. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and of all who had been slaughtered on the earth. Now we have read Babylon, the great city. Is this talking about a rebuilt Babylon? In present, in present time, it's in ruins. Here are some, uh, some pictures of the ruins in Babylon, of old Babylon. When Saddam Hussein was in power, he was in the process of rebuilding Babylon. You can see the new walls there, uh, along with the old walls of Nebuchadnezzar's time. And uh, that's uh, Saddam Hussein's uh, palace. Of course, uh, he has lost power, but in 1987, he threw a big um, celebration in Babylon, invited people from all over the world to come to this uh, celebration. He issued this medallion which shows Nebuchadnezzar in the background and Saddam Hussein imposed over Nebuchadnezzar. He viewed himself and he claimed to be the next Nebuchadnezzar because he wanted to rebuild Babylon in all of its glory. He wanted to reestablish the principles on which Babylon was built and the Tower of Babel was built. Now, does this mean that the city will be rebuilt? Well, some believe that it will. They point to passages in Isaiah 13 and 14 and Jeremiah 50 and 51 and say the destruction of Babylon as it, as it is predicted there has not been literally fulfilled. So they look for a rebuilding of the city and its destruction. Others say, no, that's not necessary because that is simply destruction terminology that's used. And uh, what we should learn from that is that uh, what Babylon represents will be destroyed. And that certainly is true, where the rebuilding of the city, to my mind, is questionable. Uh, Time will tell, but certainly God is going to end this idolatrous system that glorifies man, that leaves God out, and that is designed to build man up through the accumulation of wealth. Uh, it's almost impossible to imagine life without the buying and selling that goes on in the world, the, com the commerce, whether it's capitalism, socialism, communism, fascism, atheism, uh, but that's going to happen. No longer when Jesus comes back will people glorify themselves like they do now. They still have a fallen, depraved human nature, of course. 
nor will this system of buying and selling continue as it is now. So what? A, a worldwide religion is on the horizon. We can uh, deduce this from chapter 17. This woman is sitting astride the beast, controlling it. In the Middle Ages, the popes controlled the Holy Roman, Roman Empire rulers. And uh, throughout history, religion has had a dominating influence on the effect of politics. We need to be aware of this. Uh, the World Council of Churches, the National Council of Churches, of course, want to bring all of the churches together, unite even pagan religions into one. They're not very successful <laughs> because uh, people don't want to give up these distinctions. But one day, Antichrist will do it, and everybody will worship him. We should avoid selfish materialism, which God will judge one day. This is the excessive wealth of her luxury, chapter 18, verse 3. And rather than excluding God from life, as the world system does, we should acknowledge God in every aspect of our lives. So these are some practical points that we can apply in our lives. Our time is gone, so let's pray. Father, we thank you for this revelation, and while it is bewildering in some respects. Uh, you have yourself interpreted much of it for our understanding, and we pray that we will glean these lessons from what you have revealed, and that we will not be more knowledgeable, but we will be more pleasing to you as we respond to what we have read. In Jesus' name, amen.